Our verse for this new series that, uh, that Troy mentioned is found in Matthew 5. Picks up at 14. It says, Jesus speaking, he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives life to everyone in the house. And here's the verse I really want you to, to see here. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Why don't we say that together? In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's, now let's just personalize that for a moment. Let my light shine before others. Make that a prayer. Let's say that together. Let my light shine before others, that they may see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to we let our light shine in a way that points to you, that glorifies you, that lifts you up, that draws people to you. Help us learn how to do that in the coming weeks. Help us see how we can let our light shine. And I pray this in Jesus' name, the light of the world. Amen. So that's what we want to do. We want to let our light shine, but how? Anytime someone gives you a task and they say, I want you to do this, one of the follow-up questions quickly is, well, how? How do I do that? How do you want that done? What does that look like? We have small grandchildren. And sometimes you teach them some things. And you, you have to go. You could say, do a somersault. What's a somersault? Well, a somersault is how you, you just flip over. Well, how do I do that? We're like little children in these things of God. We're, how? How do I do this? Well, earlier this year, we looked at how sin shows up in our lives in the different ways. And, and someone back in the, developed back in the fourth century and, and then kind of codified in the sixth century, someone came up with this idea of the seven deadly or, or mortal sins. And they represented sinful dispositions that gave rise to other sins. And we know that, that darkness is seen as kind of an overarching metaphor for sin. And if that's the case, then light serves as the opposite. It's this overarching metaphor that points to the actions that bring life. So rather than revisit the, the seven deadly sins, I thought it would be fun to instead visit the corresponding virtues so that we can see how we, they can help us bring light into the world. So if sin brought darkness, these virtues help us bring light. Now, pride is often listed as the first of the, the deadly sins. What's the opposite of pride? Humility. Well, what is humility? Well, if you just go to a dictionary, it'll say the quality or condition of being humble, modest opinion, or estimate of one's own importance, rank, etc. The Greek word for humble found in the New Testament means to, to make low. The Greek word then for humility signifies to lower your mind, lower your thinking. That is, lower your thinking of yourself. Now, what we're aiming for here is not to sit around and go, I'm a nothing, I'm a zero. No, it's, it's rather to put yourself in the proper perspective. To see yourself as God sees you, no more, no less. To help us grasp then what this humility looked like, I want us to look at the Old Testament character, Joseph. Now, if you're not familiar with Joseph, let me kind of put him in where he fits in the biblical narrative. We have creation, stars, heavens, earth, all this, man, woman. Then we have the fall, when Adam and Eve said, eh, we'd rather have the fruit than obey God. We go by a number of generations, and then we have Noah and the flood, we go some more generations and we have Abraham, 
called to what would be known as the promised land. Abraham has a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. The second youngest is Joseph. And he is apparently the favorite. In Genesis 37, we read, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers. The sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. We learn a little bit about Joseph in this moment, don't we? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him, sometimes called the coat of many colors. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, that's something that we unfortunately see in, in these patriarchs is they're they, Family dynamics aren't always great. But God is still working. We're told Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Wouldn't you want to hear that from your younger brother that you know your mom and dad like more than you? It's just, ah, this guy. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, I had another dream and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Now he knew what it meant. They knew what it meant. Nobody really liked it. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Hmm. Now you say, wait, I thought Joseph, I, jo I thought Joseph was the model of humility. He will be. He's just not there yet. Which reminds us, gives us a little hope, doesn't it? That, that, that sometimes we don't start out as strong as we finish. So Joseph is favored. His brothers hate him for it. And he points out just constantly. You know, he's just kind of almost rubbing it in. There's more here. His brothers would eventually kidnap him, plan to kill him. But one of the brothers said, no, 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 we're not going to kill him. And so they wound up selling him to a caravan that was on its way down to Egypt. And there he became a servant to one of Pharaoh's officials, a man by the name of Potiphar. And we read this, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And so it sounds like, well, maybe things aren't so bad for Joseph after all. But then we read now Joseph was well bid and built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I then do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now we begin to see the humility showing up in Joseph. And we first see it this, a humility through faithful obedience. Pride would have said, well, why not? I've been mistreated. I'm suffering from injustice. I didn't ask to be here. I deserve this. Why shouldn't I have a little fun? Humility said it's wrong to take what was not his to have. And he gave in to humility. Eventually, Potiphar's wife grew angry from the rejection and she accused Joseph of trying to attack her. This landed Joseph in prison. And about this point, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, come on. 
I learned my lesson. I'm trying to do the right thing. I was, I was faithful in obedience. I didn't do the wrong thing when I was, might have been tempted to or was tempted to. And now here, this is what I get. But not Joseph. It says, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, Joseph is not some puppet here. You know, the God is just kind of working them through. Joseph is doing well because Joseph is leaning into the Lord, trusting in the Lord. Seeking to do what is right. And here's another face of humility, if you would. It's through personal reliability. Humility, or I should say pride, would have sulked. Would have said, I'm too good to work in a prison. Don't you know who I am? I'm the favored son. I had a coat to prove it. Humility takes another angle. Jesus said, love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Do you see Joseph doing that? Living that out here? These are the actions of humility. And Joseph is choosing the humble way. And in doing so is providing a growing light to those around him. People are noticing there's something different about Joseph. And it's getting connected to his God. Now, how do you respond when wronged? What, what's your go-to thing? Do you sulk? Do you throw a, a temper tantrum? Do you uh, attack the person, what do you do? Is it being led by pride? Or have you thought about the way of humility? Humility drove Joseph to stay the course, to be true to his faith, to be a constant for other people. Was it easy? We should not think that it was. Faithfulness, humility, it's never an easy thing to humble yourself. It can go against everything that your emotions are screaming out. But if we choose that way, there's a light that wasn't there before. While in prison, Joseph correctly interpreted the troubling dream, dreams of two other prisoners put in there by Pharaoh himself. He said that one of the prisoners would be executed and the other one would be restored to his position. And when that happened, he asked the fellow who was restored to his position, hey, <laughs> Will you tell Pharaoh about me? Let, let him know I'm, I, I don't belong here. Would you make an appeal on my behalf? But that man forgot about Joseph. So happy to be in his own restored position, forgot all about him. Finally, though, when Pharaoh had some troubling dreams that no one could understand, no one could interpret it, no one could give him any understanding about Finally, this cupbearer to the Pharaoh said, oh, I remember there was this guy in prison and he interpreted my dream and another guy's dream and it happened just like he said. So they summoned Joseph, they clean him up and they set him before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. See this other face of humility? Humility through redirected praise. He could have said, well, well, yes, thank you very much. I do have that ability. Finally, finally, somebody sees my worth. I'm going to play this for everything I can get. You know, he could, have, he could have said, you know, it's really hard to interpret dreams when you've been eating prison food all day long. Have you got something better for me? 
He could have really milked that for all it's worth, but he doesn't. Instead, he re redirects the praise to God. It's not me. It's my God. That's what humility does. Whether we point to God, to our teammates, to our employees, to our co-workers. Harry Truman said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. In this age of self-promotion that, that has been democratized by social media, we can all do it. We can all put it out there. How many likes can we get? How many views can we get? How many followers can we get? Look at me, look at me, look at me. And the world has lots of that. And is the world improved by it? No. But what happens when someone says, it's not me. It's not me. Pride says, I did it. I'm responsible. Make sure I get the credit. Humility takes another path. Now the dreams that Pharaoh had pointed, or had pointed to seven upcoming years of plentiful crops that were gonna be followed by seven years of famine. Joseph also then recommended a plan to hold back some of the crops during the plentiful years to sustain them through the years of famine. Pharaoh was so impressed that he put Joseph in charge of the project, making him second in command in Egypt. During the years of famine, Joseph's family also experienced it where they were at. And so Jacob sent his sons down to Egypt to buy grain. They had to deal, though, with Joseph, who they assumed was long dead. That's what they had told their dad. Well, he, look, he, an animal got him and got killed, and they showed him. They put some goat's blood on, it, on his wonderful coat and said he's dead. Everybody is probably, that troublemaker, is, he's gone. And Joseph took his time in revealing his true identity. And it's some, some interesting stuff we don't have time to get into today. But eventually, this is what happens. It says, Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one who sold you into Egypt. Now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. What would you have done? All that you had suffered over the years because of these guys? And now you have a chance. You could, Joseph could speak the word and they would be killed on the spot. That's all he had to do. He's second in Joseph. These guys are spies, kill them all. No one would have answered the question. They would have just done it. But Joseph takes a different perspective because of humility. He shows humility by looking at things with a different perspective. What perspective does he choose? God's. Later, Joseph would assure them of his attitude. He said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, how do you forgive when you have been wrong, when you have been hurt? How do you forgive? It's, it's hard to do that when you put your own interests and your own concerns first, like pride wants you to do. When you see yourself as the center of the universe, but if you step back for a moment and try to see every person is accountable to God, then you can release people to God's justice. You can let God deal with them rather than you meeting out the punishment. Looking at people and circumstances from God's perspective should be the goal of every follower of Jesus. We have so many issues facing our country. Every generation has a new set of issues before them. 
And we're no different. Just in our own country, we're dealing with a pandemic. We're all getting tired of masks. We've got immigration issues. We, we, we've got economic issues. We, we've got all this stuff going on. And we're all tempted to say, well, let me, let me tell you what I think about that. Are we stopping to ask ourselves, well, what does God think about that? And if we don't do that, if we don't step back and go, wait a minute, okay, what is God's word? How does it inform me on, on any myriad of issues before us, whether they be large national issues or just the personal stuff we deal with with our family and at our workplaces? If we're not asking that question, how can we let our light shine? If we won't humble ourselves, if we won't push pride out of the way and say, come here, humility, guide me in this. How can we let our light shine? How will we be any different from the world? How can we lift up our God if we won't take time to see things from his perspective? You know, there's the, the old thing, WWJD. You remember that? What would Jesus do? Wrong question. Wrong question. Jesus can do whatever Jesus wants to do because Jesus is God in the flesh and he gets to do things you and I don't get to do. The question is, what would Jesus have me do? What would Jesus have me do? That's not a point in your outline if you were looking for it. But it's good to write down. What would Jesus have me do? Philippians 2, Paul writes this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Isn't that what Joseph did time and time again? Isn't that how you, after, <laughs> yes, he starts out saying, hey, I got some fabulous dreams. Which come true, by the way. But he gets to a place, he gets humbled, he humbles himself. And this is how you see it time and time again. When he's, Potiphar's wife is begging him to come to bed with her, he's looking out for the interests of the man who held him at as a slave. When he's in prison, when he could have said, I'm, I'm just gonna do my time over here, he's serving, he's helping out, he's becoming a reliable people, he's looking out for the interests of others. When he's, when he's brought forth and he has a chance to say, look, we can, if we, here's a plan in which we can save thousands upon thousands of people's lives, he's looking out to the interests of others. When his brothers come before him, when he could have easily had them killed on the spot, he's looking out to the interests of others. This is why Joseph gives us some great examples of what humility looks like and what we should do. Here's the good news. Because I know it's hard to be humble. It's, it's hard, you know, not, I'm not talking about, you know, humble like, you know, it's hard to say, no, no, don't look at me. I'm talking about in day-to-day -day stuff that you and I deal with. It can be hard to choose the humble way, to look out for the interests of others. But you can be humble because Jesus was humble. On your, for your behalf. You can be humble because the one who was worthy of all honor and power humbled himself. If we go on in this passage in Philippians, we read this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What was his mindset? It says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. All that stuff we just looked at, Jesus did it. Even though he is God, he humbled himself. It says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You 
You see, our natural, sinful inclination is to go to pride. Rely on pride. Take the path of pride. Why? Because out of self-preservation, to lift ourselves up. But I can let go of that. I don't need that. Because Jesus, Jesus took the humble path and died in my stead. He became obedient so that in my disobedience, I might still be forgiven. He was faithful so that even in my unfaithfulness, I can be forgiven. And one day, like Joseph's brothers, we will all bow down, not to Joseph, but to Jesus. And right now, as we take communion, you can bow down. When you take of that bread and you take of that cup, you can admit, Jesus is Lord. You're proclaiming that. He is Lord. He is my Savior. I will humble myself and let him be Lord of my life. I will humble myself and let him be my savior rather than trying to save myself. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, I thank you that we have in this moment a chance to be reminded of what humility looks like. And to see now in these very simple little elements, this little piece of bread, this little cup of juice, we can see humility in action. And we can be thankful for the grace that made it all possible. And we can proclaim Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection every day and in this moment now. We can put aside pride and take hold of humility and put the spotlight on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.